Well, good afternoon. I would like to welcome all of you to the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Speaker Series. Uh, with today's program, given the nature and scope of uh, Pegasus Global Holdings and the two principals uh, that are the uh, chief officers of the company, uh, who happen to also be married, uh, we're going to follow a little bit different pattern here. And uh, Patricia and Chris will be seated at the table. Uh, they've got uh, points that they want to cover. We've sort of uh, identified some of the main topics that will be uh, shown on the PowerPoint point slides, and uh, I will, if I don't screw things up, I will advance those slides uh, so you can kind of keep track of the things they're talking about. Uh, but this is an opportunity for them to, uh, I think, really give you a different kind of flavor with regard to uh, uh, building a global enterprise, and in, in some sense, it doesn't really matter where you do that. Uh, and they've been highly successful with that. Again, I encourage you to read uh, the biographical information about them that's in the program. And probably more than anything else, I would encourage you to go to their website uh, where you can find out about Pegasus Global Holdings as well as uh, Dr. Patricia Galloway and Dr. Chris Nielsen and uh, all the great work that they have done. I'll start off briefly. Uh, why we want to talk about this topic. One, we live in a great area. The Kittitas County area is a great area. In addition, most of the prior talks have been about products, innovative products, entrepreneurism, entrepreneurism that develop these projects. We're going to talk about service business. We're a management consulting firm with an engineering bent. And I'll explain that, or Pat will explain that in a little bit. So that when we talked last time in November with about venture capital on products, there's very few venture capitalists out there that will provide funding for entrepreneurial ideas in the service area unless you've got an idea like Facebook. And that took a little bit of doing. So, we want to talk and explore how we established this business, what it took. We've worked in 84 countries. There's very few firms, except for the largest corporations, that can say they've worked in 84 countries. And that's been in the last 38 years. And so four decades, 84 countries. So with that, I'll let, turn it over to Pat and let her describe what Pegasus as a, as a firm is really all about and the services that we provide. Oh, it's a good to have a little base of knowing what it is that we're selling. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about what we sell first. We primarily sell management consulting, risk management, strategic advisory services, and we also serve as arbitrators, mediators in do negotiated settlements for parties. But now what does that mean and who do we sell that to? Because those are terms that everyone is, is um, I'm sure, heard of and aware, but we probably do it in a little bit different way than you're used to hearing about. First of all, we sell our services to what's termed as the, the C-suite, senior management of companies and top officials in governments and boards of directors. I mean, that is who our client is. Rather, if you hear about construction management firms and program management firms, they're primarily selling to what I would call the, the middle management level. So we, we are up at the very top, and there's a lot usually at stake, which is why we are called in. Our industry sectors include primarily the oil and gas industry, um, the energy um, industry in total, the infrastructure industry with a uh, heavy bent on uh, transportation, and then we have just the general, I'd say, construction area. But it's primarily energy area and the infrastructure with transportation as the key areas that we focus on. The energy area includes the oil and gas industry on one side and the power generation on the other side. And in both all of, around the world. Yes, and in both of those, we do work for either the private companies, publicly traded companies, or governments themselves. 
So one of the things that we're going to, to do is we're going to go through an awful lot of things today that we think are successful, things that we have found successful, and things that you'll be able to take away with you when you leave here today. But uh, I think Chris wants to maybe also give you a little brief um, idea of why we chose Clay Ellum. Very, very simply, I can say it's the great work ethic of the people of eastern Washington, and in particular the Kittitas Valley, the great environment here. Those are two of the most important things. I started my career, was born, started my career, educated in the Northeast, precisely New York City. And I can tell you there's a stark difference <laughs> between Kittitas County and New York City. We, 250 mile radius of New York City, there's 50 million people. Do a 200 mile radius around this area and you get maybe 5 million, maybe. And where we started our business in New York City, but then we moved out to Princeton, New Jersey. The distance between Princeton, New Jersey is 100 miles. That's the same distance from the waterfront in Seattle to the ranch. Put a dot in the middle, I'm sorry, the dot in the middle is uh, Snoqualmie Pass. The distance between uh, Philadelphia and Manhattan is exactly 100 miles. You put a dot in the middle and that's Princeton, New Jersey. And there's a vast difference. So I found when I came out here to the Seattle area in 1975 to finish building the King Dome and work with King County, I stepped off the airplane and I knew I had come to Nirvana. It took me a long period of time to graduate out here, uh, 30 years to be precise, but uh, we were bi-coastal for many years. And then the last thing is the exceptional personnel that are available to us out here in Kittitas County and Eastern Washington are phenomenal. Uh, you would think there was a very easy to find personnel with good work ethic, with good entrepreneurial orientation, uh, in New York City, it's quite the opposite, despite the fact there's so many of them. So that's why, just in a summary fashion, why we like it out here. So moving on now to giving a little bit of the prerequisites of going global. As you uh, see from the slide, I hope. Good. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> uh, focus, 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 and um, being nimble. Well, what do we mean by being focused, focused, focused? Well, first of all, if you're starting a company and you're wanting to go global, you have to ask yourself, what is it that you want to do? I mean, you can't do everything, and you can't do everything in every country, and you can't be everything that you would like to be to everybody. While it seems that the, the world is getting smaller and smaller, it's still a pretty big place. <laughs> So what if you have to do is consider that, one, it takes, it takes some capital to go overseas. You also just can't enter the international market and the global market because you have an internet and you can talk to anybody 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's true, but that's not what it takes to drive a service business. And so you really have to decide what is going to be your niche what is it that you're going to sell? Who might your potential customers be? And how are you going to reach those people? And once you sort of generally have that laid out, before you go start again, and we heard this by um, our introduction today, and that's called a business plan. I mean, it's very, very important whether you're capitalizing this yourself or whether you're going to go out and seek capital from a bank or some type of financing to start your company, you still are going to be required to have a business plan. And why is that again? Because it helps you focus 
what it is you're going to sell, who your market will be, and how you are best going to approach that market. And that is the way that you will, are then able to track your own milestones. It's how is a bank or your lender tracks your milestones, tracks your revenues coming in versus your expenses going out. Are you tracking on your objectives? Are you tracking on who you actually thought you're going to see? And what is your success rate on actually landing potential clients and potential services and over what period of time. So all of this has to be laid out before you even step out of your door to go conquer the world. <laughs> focus, focus, focus. That is really true. We're both engineers. She's got an MBA in finance and a doctorate in civil engineering. I'm a mechanical engineer, a lawyer, and I got a doctorate in civil engineering. And that defined what we wanted to do. We sat down and determined that what would we want to sell and what would people want to buy from us. So we actually set out to find a mechanism where we could combine all three areas, engineering, finance, and law. And we figured that we were best, we had most experience in the construction, engineering and construction industry. So those were two focuses. Focus on the engineering construction industry and then figure out how we could combine the three areas. So that is what we mean by focusing. And we'll give you several examples as we go through the afternoon of how this has evolved, but there's still a common element even when we're advising some of the largest investment funds in the world. Uh, nowadays, I advise the chief economist at Deutsche Bank and the chief economist of Nomura, which is the old Lehman Brothers Asia. You know, part of Lehman Brothers that didn't get into trouble. Uh, and they rely on me when I talk to them every two weeks to discuss what's going on in the world in the engineering and construction area in those three industries, the oil and gas, the power generation, and the uh, infrastructure areas. Now, what? that's another focus area. Why is that an important focus area? What do people need? They need energy and they need infrastructure. The more infrastructure that we have, the more productive as an economic entity the country or the region or the locality is. So if we didn't have infrastructure to get from eastern Washington to western Washington where we can then transship via rail, uh, sea, or air would be a disaster. And we, the agricultural industry actually on this side of the, the mountains wouldn't exist. So that's the third focus area. And those are very important focus areas. Now, there, you get down, cuts down below these upper level focus areas, but you've got to determine what you want to focus on. The other thing is, you may want to focus on that, but who's going to buy it? And you'll see that in the discussion that we have this afternoon. Now, when you start out a business, as Pat said, don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go conquer the world. It won't happen, especially as a small entrepreneurial business. No matter how innovative you think you are, uh, you've got to start locally, regionally, nationally, in, in the case of a U.S. company, and then transfer that technology or that service to the overseas markets and the various variations of the overseas market that occur. Uh, Pat will talk a little bit about choosing the right country. Yeah, so 
If you want to go global, as I said, you just can't say, okay, I'm going global. That, that doesn't mean anything. So you have to choose which country you would like to go into. And that country, of course, is going to have to be researched. One, do they need the service that you're offering? And why do they need that service? Why do you think they need what you're selling? Two, who within the country then is interested in buying what you're selling and why? Three, how is it going to, uh, is it going to be easy for you to get to that country? Um, are you going to have to require uh, visas for you to get into that country? Are you going to be limited to how long you can stay in the country? Are you going to easily be able to get a work visa in that company? Are they going to be able to actually contract with you as a U.S. company, depending on the country that you select? What is the culture of that country? of that country. Is that culture going to mesh with your, with your own behavior, your own culture? Are you going to actually be able to sit in front of someone and actually be able to communicate with them? Or are you going to have cultural barriers that is going to prevent you from carrying on that type of a conversation? You certainly don't pick a country by saying, I think I'd like to go vacation in France, so that might be somewhere where I would like to start a business. Where you might like to go is probably the last reason you should go. And one of the uh, really great uh, examples in our experience is uh, Chris talked about Venezuela, uh, Japan, and Brazil, three countries that you would probably think, oh my gosh, why would they choose those countries? Well, on the one example on Japan, we sell improvement of project management services. But we do it at a high level, not a middle level. And you would think, well, why would senior management ever be interested, quote, in project management services? Because that is a middle level management. Well, it's not if you are a Japanese uh, contractor who had never had to know anything about project management because in the culture within Japan it's a handshake on contracts never did have to produce a cost report never did have to produce a schedule on when things would be done never had to produce a project management plan and now the world is open to you as the Japanese country with its contractors to go out and build some of the world's largest construction projects but under the contracts on an international basis they are required to do monthly reports, cost reports, schedules when they're going to get it done, present those, communicate them, all the things that the Japanese did not do very well. So by researching all of that and being in the construction industry, it was easy for us, not easy, it took time, it takes time, it takes going and being in, we'll get into this a little bit later so I won't um, try um, go off of that tangent right now, but it takes time to do that. So. We went to Japan to sell that service to that client for their offshore work. And that's why we became extremely successful in Japan, because if you know anything about the, the culture, then you learn that they become very loyal to those that they can work well with. And when companies also find out that some another friend company of theirs has used somebody well, then that's how you multiply your business. So with that though, you take some, some source of financing to be able to get to those countries and that's what Chris will talk about. We're just, we're just exploring the general concepts, but when we started out, we got an SBA loan, Small Business Administration loan. We couldn't talk any bank into what we wanted to do to lend us money. And after two years of successfully paying back an SBA loan, that was what was required at that time, then we could go and talk a commercial bank into it. I think it was Mellon Bank that uh, we first talked, uh, talked into giving us a commercial loan. Now, four years later, four years after the founding of the firm, we had an economic crisis, not nearly as bad as today, but damn near. That actually we got into in 1979 and stretched all the way till the late 80s. 
the and really the belief that we conveyed to the banker saved us because he could see us out there doing and trying to achieve success and we had limited success but we were still having a lot not a lot but having a, a, a vision that we wanted to pursue we were nimble and that nimble allowed us to go to other projects other areas of the country and we still wanted to get off shore and that'll come about about 1983-84 uh, you know Pat mentioned France or Japan the Japanese way of understanding project management understanding business is completely opposite of the Western thought they admire Western business and they want Western business concepts but they wouldn't apply them in Japan so we had to work for 15 years for Japanese companies starting in the late 80s on offshore offshore of Japan projects never in Japan then as Pat said they got used to working with us and that enabled them to allow us opportunities to work for them in Japan now they use us all the time because they don't have a clue uh, really you can tell that by their economy uh, and but we also use the Japanese to get into China we wanted to get into China but when we wanted to go into China 20 years ago they offered us a boatload of kumquats I'm no kidding boatload of kumquats in payment I wanted to get paid in US dollars and that's part of the financing plan always get paid in US dollars so the uh, the Japanese were making very strong forays into China I wasn't proud I would go with the Japanese there's other reasons for going that way such as the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act which I'll talk about but that allowed us to get paid by the Japanese where we were actually doing most of the work on the projects and at the high levels nowadays there's no problem with working for the for the Chinese and uh, actually they're quite fond of us cutting the Japanese out of the picture so uh, it, it, it's the it's the dynamics and the dynamics of each individual country project management in France is totally alien to the way anybody else in the in Europe or North America does project management and unless you understand the way projects are executed by the French you can talk till you're blue in the face and it's just making you blue in the face because they will pay no attention to you especially in the nuclear industry when we did projects in the nuclear industry in France we were very unsuccessful at convincing them and convincing them of our recommendations but then we started to understand the French way of doing business which was different than the Italian which was different than the German which was different than the British and nimbleness is part of listening and the Americans are very bad at listening and that was another focus area that I forgot to mention do you, do you, just because we do business a certain way they want to know of that business but um, but you've got to listen and adapt and adjust to the business so when he's talking about culture so I brought a book that all of you that are interested in going global should have on your bookshelf and it is updated like every two uh, well <laughs> you could put it on your desk but then it might be hard to work <laughs> sorry <laughs> The difference between her desk and my desk is quite different. So this is a book called Kiss, Bow, and Shake Hands. And it's from an author, two authors, Terry Morrison and Wayne Conaway. And I must tell you that it is, 
it's something that we have used for, gosh, ever since the, the mid-80s. The mid and this is the, the second edition of it, but it covers 60 different countries. And what this book does is it gives you, it doesn't tell you how you sell your business, but it tells you how to work your behavior, the types of research you must do, how you would act in a particular country so that you don't embarrass yourself or you don't insult your potential client. So it goes all the way from talking about giving you a little historical part on each country, giving you a little bit about how they do business, giving you a little bit about their language, their financial, uh, but then it talks about how you would approach a client. It would talk about how you would even hand a business card to a client. Uh, for instance, we were talking about Japan. Well, in Japan, the business card is considered um, seriously part of their person. And so when you uh, have your business card, which I just happen to have one here,